So welcome to Artful Wellness. Today uh, we are going to be sitting down with an amazing guest. I'm very, very, very excited to introduce her and for our audience to learn a little bit about who she is. Her name is Jordana Goldlist. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. Absolutely. Thank you for for taking the time and coming to chat with me today. Um, so on our podcast, we're, we're talking about a lot of different themes in regards to addiction and mental health and just education and awareness in general. So I think that's where most of our conversation is going to go today since we have a real specialist in the house and I think someone who can offer um, a really unique and, and knowledgeable perspective. So um, I guess we'll just start, Jordana, kind of just knowing what it is that you do currently and a little bit about who you are. Sure. So I'm a criminal defense lawyer. I uh, am the founder and I operate my own practice called JHG Criminal Law. Uh, We focus only on individuals charged with criminal offenses and uh, I spend the majority of my time representing people who are charged with murder, serious violence, um, drug trafficking, and firearms offenses. So more of the high-risk criminal litigation. I've been doing that for the last nine years. um, And uh, I really am passionate about putting the work in in order to give people the best results. Um, But a collaboratory to that is I've also been doing some public speaking and raising awareness Mm -hmm. about the implications of a criminal record and the trap of the criminal justice system. Mm-hmm. And so I'm finding a very large audience of people who either were un- unaware of the way the criminal justice system treats people and keeps people stuck, or people who have found themselves stuck and didn't believe that there was a way out. And mm-hmm. so I've tried to use as well my own experiences um, to highlight and show that it is possible to escape the throes of mental health issues, addiction, and criminality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you sound really passionate about the field. So what is it that brought you to working in this field specifically? So I wanted to be a criminal lawyer from the time I was a kid. Like (laughs) when I was seven or eight, you asked me what I want to be when I grow up. I always said a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Uh, I didn't really understand the social justice aspect of being a lawyer. Um, I understood from watching a family member who was charged criminally go through the system. And I learned the importance of the role of a lawyer and the title of a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even necessarily know the lawyer's name, but when the lawyer called our house, the only thing I heard was, hey, the lawyer's on the phone, be quiet, turn Mm -hmm. off the TV, stop playing, it's the lawyer. And this title, the lawyer, you know, drew such attention in the house. And I wanted that. I wanted to have that level of respect. I wanted to have the ability to call some stranger's house and the whole world stop spinning. Mm that sort of dream uh, I thought was shattered by uh, teenage years that I had spent in and out of group homes uh, on and off the street um, that resulted in me dropping out of high school at 17 years old. Um, From 17 to 19, I was a a homeless high school dropout where the labels that were probably most fitting. And and I thought I had ruined any chance that I had of, of being a lawyer. Um, I graduated from high school when I was 21, went straight into university, and still didn't really know what I was going to do. I just knew that I needed an education. Mm -hmm. And sort of year by year, um, I grew more confident in my ability to to turn my life around, I guess, and come back to thinking that childhood dream was a possibility. And through my, my... you know, applications together for law school at 24 years old uh, and found myself accepted to Osgoode Hall Law School. Mm -hmm. And so for me, um, it was something that I wanted to do when I was really young without appreciating the role of the advocate. Mm -hmm. And when I was going through the system myself and trying to escape it myself, I started, you know, realizing the importance of advocacy. I started realizing the importance of having someone who's in your corner to fight for you and I started seeing a lot of people through my life that didn't have that I was fortunate enough to have family and close friends who even though they took a back seat while I was on the streets they were waiting for me to want to do different for myself and I had that support Mm -hmm. and I saw people who faltered because they didn't have that support and so in law school, I realized I wanted to be that support system for other people, albeit in a, you know, in a different role, but people who are going through the criminal justice system. Yeah. I mean, I feel like there's so many things that we can talk about today <laughs> in our in our warm up. I know our conversation got really, you know, deep and, and insightful on some pretty 
even kind of contemporary and current issues that we're kind of facing in regards to not only the legal system, but mental health as well. Absolutely. Um, I watched your TED talk. It was incredible. There's the TED talk Jordana does. It's called Who Judges the Judge? That's right. And I love so many points that you made, pretty much every single one. But the things that really stood out to me first was kind of what you were just saying. You know, a lot of people, when they're in a position of power, like a lawyer or a doctor or these people who, when they call, everyone stops and listens, aren't always cognizant of what that power can do for good. Right. And I feel like it sounds like your personal story is your journey of becoming this dream and reaching this, for lack of a better word, powerful place, but really cha- cha- channeling it into um, a, a helpful, advocating social justice sort of way, right? which I think is amazing. And that was sort of the goal. Like I was going through law school feeling very disconnected from my peers and I thought that I had to sort of pack up and put away the life that I had lived in order to be successful in this other role. But I had promised myself that if I achieved some level of success, and I use that term loosely because it all depends on how we define it, of course. But when I felt like I was in a place that was successful, I wanted to unpack that history to show, A, other people who are struggling that you can get out and be that example but i also wanted to expose to you know colleagues and other people that hold these titles that you know you can't just judge a person by the title that they hold you don't know their history you don't know their character and that's mm-hmm. something that i talk a lot in my ted talk as well as you know even in my role i, I work for covenant house as a mentor um i've done speaking engagements with various organizations that are helping uh, women try to escape human trafficking and the point is we have to be able to overcome these titles in order to get ahead and we need to be able to expose that the title we currently have may or may not define who we are as a person Mm -hmm. which i'm hoping we're going to be able to discuss a little bit more absolutely sort of risks of having these titles and labels, right? Um, Another thing I just want to bring up first, though, is in the podcast so far, we've had this running theme of lived experience, right? you know, and the importance of on our team here at Addiction Rehab Toronto, we have quite a number of staff who are in recovery themselves, or like myself, really struggle with anxiety or um, our psychotherapist who shared in a previous podcast some experiences from abusive relationships and and substance use and stuff like that so what I love again is we're getting to your lived experience for almost the population that you're able to advocate for and what that does I'm sure or you can correct me if I'm wrong to help the whole process make it a little bit more effective um for everyone involved, but most importantly, the individual that you're trying to support. Right. And I mean, I think that's the thing. You can relate to people in their experience if you have a shared experience without necessarily talking about that experience, right? So before the last year, I really wasn't public about what my experience was. I didn't talk about being, you know, in group homes and not out, out of the streets and, you know, having been, albeit for a very short time but a a brief stint in jail and and understanding what it's like to be treated like an inmate you know these aren't things that I was sharing with individual clients but that experience is what allowed me to ignore what their current situation was and try to understand them as a person and treat them with that mutual respect Mm -hmm. right because the reality is like I'm always only two choices away from being that person again Mm -hmm. right putting myself in a position and accepting that you know, possibility, right? I I can go back to that life at any time. Mm -hmm. And it's only my choices when I wake up each and every day to stay sober, that keep me sober. Mm -hmm. And I'm always aware of that. So I think that, you know, when I meet new clients, I treat them with the same respect that I want to be treated. And I want to learn what has, you know, happened in their lives that puts them in a position where they're in front of me. Mm -hmm. right because it's different for everyone the label criminal the label you know accused um the label drug addict like that doesn't tell us who that person is it just tells us what situation they're currently facing Mm 
Mm -hmm. I don't think it's enough to judge them as a person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think too, in terms of the label, it's also very connected to mental health. Absolutely. Um, And we try and do again, I mean, I don't want to have to keep bringing it back to our center, but it's just so much of what I do and can have that shared experience with you. But just really looking at even our clients as from a holistic standpoint, right. especially in regards to things like anxiety um, or depression. And I think, you know, when you said we're, you're two steps away from being in the same place, and I don't mean this in a minimizing way, but I feel like we're all kind of two steps away from being in a different place. That may be something that we never imagined we'd be in, right? right? And I only say that because I truly believe in it. mental health being it is a human experience and it doesn't discriminate against me or you or someone who's living on the street or someone who's a criminal or someone who's you know been a pastor for their whole life right like it's really something that we we're all struggling with and to make that effort every day to choose to work on yourself and to choose to have a purposeful life of maybe helping others or whatever it might be for each individual person right and i think that you know sharing that idea with more people helps them realize a how vulnerable they and the people around them really are Mm -hmm. but on the flip side i'm hoping that that message gets into all of the people that you serve and that i work with because if you believe that you can overcome that and you're only two steps away from living the dream that you want Mm -hmm. then you're motivated to make those change Mm -hmm. i see a lot of people that are you know stuck Uh, And it's something that, you know, we talked about earlier and I talk about my TED talk, this whole concept of the label becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so if you label someone as having anxiety disorder and they believe it's not possible to overcome, then they're comfortable just, you know, hiding out in their room all day thinking that I have anxiety, therefore I can't go out instead of saying, yes, I have anxiety, but let me figure out how I overcome that because Mm -hmm. you can't overcome that. You just need to figure out the ways obviously and, and get down to what the actual underlying issues are yeah and once you start treating those you get to live you know as as fulsome a life as you want yeah and that's the power of positive thinking you know someone graduated once from our program and at their speech they they were talking about what they learned um that what positive thinking meant to them and they described it as the ability to see the solution no matter what the situation i love that i love it too (laughs) yeah i love it too and i actually use it a lot as you know after hearing that and it's really what we try and practice here okay we're feeling anxious like let's sit with it right let's name the anxiety right you know let's talk about it you know and the thing that we don't do and also something that I've been trying to teach some of the youth in transition that I work with is trying to use your situation of adversity to your advantage Mm -hmm. I love that I always saw it as a disadvantage Right. I mm-hmm. thought that because of the life that I lived as a teenager, it was I was going to have to work so much harder than, you know, in order to catch up with my peers. It was going to take me that much longer. And um, uh, if I could even overcome mm-hmm. the life that I had lived in order mm-hmm. to have, you know, a, a phenomenal life. Um, but the reality was the struggles that I had to overcome, the strength that I had, the ability to like ignore fear which is of course a necessary component of surviving on the street Mm -hmm. is something that i get to use in my to my advantage every day you know i hear young lawyers talk about how they're scared to go into court and they have the sense of fear and you know it was a survival technique to not feel fear right you had to learn to ignore it really quickly otherwise you just curl up and die out there yeah and so the average person doesn't have that experience they weren't forced to ignore fear they let you know if you're fearful of something you avoid it you don't do it right Mm -hmm. or or you let that sort of take over um and so i try to teach a lot of people that are in a transitional point of their life to figure out how to use those situations of adversity to their advantage because Mm -hmm. they're about to enter the world with these experiences that are not Um, something that the average person gets to enjoy Mm -hmm. and gets to accomplish getting over right yeah and so if you can find a way to channel that fear or or, you know use those situations in a way that gives you a unique edge over other people within a particular field or within a particular genre Mm -hmm. um, then you're you're really further ahead yeah making that a bit more specific though I mean it all sounds really great right we 
change our path we go along the path we stay motivated we overcome fear were there any points where you felt discouraged along the way all the time and so how did you manage that I have to ignore it. Okay. <laughs> right? Okay. All the time I feel, you know, like I'm doing something different or I'm trying to challenge the status quo. Even by doing this podcast, you know, and being honest about my own experiences. Um, it's it's not the norm. It's not typical. It's not what most people are out doing. But I feel like I owe it to myself. And I owe it to other people. When I was trying to come up, when I was trying to get sober, when I was trying to get off the street, I didn't really have role models who had successfully accomplished that. Mm -hmm. In fact, quite the opposite, right? Everyone around me was stuck. I was, you know, I, I went to rehab just after I turned 19 for six months. And I was the baby in the group. It was a joke that I was so young. And I was with people who were in their 50s and 60s that had lived the same life over and over again. And they were living the same lifestyle that I was out on the street and had been doing so for decades. And that's how you feel. You feel like you're stuck. Mm -hmm. And so I had to ignore that prospect. I had to ignore what seemed to be the majority of people around me and just have this leap of faith that I could do something different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's incredible. And so do I, you know, still have my own personal psychological setbacks where I'm like, maybe I can't. What am I doing? This mm -hmm. is dumb. Or I get to a point, you know, even before my TED talk, my TED talk for me, my biggest concern was that I was bombing my career. You know, I had brought my career into a point where I had exactly what I wanted as far as caseloads and the type of clients that I want. I absolutely love the people that I feel, you know, privileged to work for. Uh, and fight for and dedicate myself to and I was worried that if I was honest about my history they weren't going to have you know trust in me mm -hmm. which is what they needed right when someone comes to a lawyer you got to trust that that lawyer is going to fight for you so here I am talking about you know 20 years ago being a street kid mm -hmm. uh, are they going to lose faith are they going to lose trust in my ability um, and that was that was probably my biggest concern and quite frankly I had the exact opposite reaction Mm -hmm. I had clients that were calling me and were just like, wow, I always knew there was something different about the way you practice. And at least now I understand why. Yeah. And so it was certainly reassuring to me, but it was not without nights that I was staying up worried about what I was about to do to myself. Yeah. And it's the power of empathy, empathy and the power of the fear of judgment. I have a lot of clients that come in and, you know, when you take away everything they use as their coping strategy for anxiety or feeling like people are judging them, you really see like the, the physical impact it takes on onto somebody right and I think it's so important going back to the lived experience to be able to support someone from an empathetic place right to say I truly understand what you're going through and I can completely validate how you're feeling a hundred percent yeah and I think that I do that without even recognizing it so I have clients that I'll just you know they're, they're frustrated they're angry and I'll say to them listen I I can totally get it. If I was in your shoes right now, I would mm -hmm. feel the same way. But they come to me for a solution, mm -hmm. right? And so I guess it's just a different perspective. I say to them, yes, I understand how you're feeling, but my job is to now like guide this ship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so this is what we're going to do to deal with it. And so it's a solution-based response. Um, but certainly that takes into account that, yeah, you're angry right now and I understand why you're angry right mm -hmm. now or this isn't the result that we wanted on this particular application. So let's go about it in another way. Yeah. We actually do validation in a lot of our groups here. Oh, that's great. And it's something that, again, in I think our podcast with the psychotherapist, she and I were talking about the importance of validation, not as something that you just do. Right. And leave it. So like what you're saying, it's not just about, okay, I understand you're angry. Right. Nothing else. It almost serves as a way to take a first step. Right. Okay. And build that trust to say, I get it. I feel you. I understand. Right. Totally fair. Yeah. But exactly what you said, what are we going to do about it? Right. Okay. So um, I appreciate you bringing that up again because I think that's a huge part of it, whether you're a lawyer or a clinical director or a psychotherapist or just a person talking to another person. Right. Right. You know, just validate one another. It's, it's so important, I think. What did you think was or what did you find was the most helpful early on in getting back on the path you were trying to 
get onto? As far as far as what? Well, like, it, whether it be you know being sober or achieving the goals, getting back into school, like what really spoke with you and getting you to that place? Was it just being in this treatment center and saying, listen, I don't want to have to do this again and be 50 or 60 years old and doing this for the sixth time? Was- yeah, I just, I had to hit a real bottom. Mm-hmm. Um, like a real bottom. I had to just have nothing left, including like my own sense of self. Mm-hmm. And I just woke up to it one day just after I turned 19 and I had just this revelation that I was I was gonna die like this and maybe it wasn't gonna be tomorrow maybe it wasn't gonna be next year um but there was no way that I wanted to spend the rest of my life feeling like I had felt for the last two years I just couldn't Mm -hmm. do it anymore and I was like reaching new bottoms that I didn't even think existed I thought you know being like having nothing being the street kid was already a bottom and then you get used to it it's almost like you got comfortable being at the bottom and and then I didn't and then I woke up and it was just this this moment I caught a reflection of myself in the mirror and I was just repulsed by what I saw uh physically um just I was 90 pounds gray colored skin I was just super unhealthy in every way and I said I don't want to live like this anymore um it wasn't you know such a snap turnaround as I'm sure you know it's it's the roller coaster right but that was really the start of me wanting to come out of that life. Um, I spent six months in rehab, which to me was huge because I had never wanted to put that kind of commitment yeah. into my sobriety. I had done like a week at you know a detox center here and there just to like take a minute off the street and be safe for a second. And then I had you know done I think the two week programs and the 30 day programs and I had a counselor that kept encouraging me to do the six month program and I was like no I'm not doing it and he had spent about four months trying to convince me that I needed this sort of time um, in order to get that foundation set and so and I didn't believe him and and once I hit this bottom I called him up and I said you know what I'm going to try it your way because my way is not working yeah and, uh, and yeah, I, I was with all of these older women that were living the same life I was. And I was like, I could probably keep going, but I just don't want to. It got to a point where I would rather die than have to live another 20 years the way I was living. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I said, I was fortunate enough to have family that was prepared to take me back once I was sober. Um, encouraged me to go to school without necessarily having like a direction. Once I got back into school, school for me was always easy. And so I just fast tracked through the high school credits I needed. Uh, I did a year at an alternative school in order to finish high school. And then I came out at 21 thinking, what am I going to do? I'm like old now, right? <laughs> like, like at 21, you're like, oh, I'm old. I just finished high school. What am I going to do with myself? Um, and really, everything was just a leap of faith. It was like, all right, let's see if I can get into university. And I didn't just get in. I got a full scholarship. And then... I was, you know, threw my hat into the ring and philosophy courses and I fell in love with them, not realizing that, you know, law schools love philosophy students. Um, And I just sort of made decisions along the way that I thought were going to be beneficial for me, even if I didn't quite understand how they were going to be beneficial. I wasn't sure how they played into the big picture. And at the back of my mind, there was always that nagging feeling of you're never going to be able to catch up to where you wanted to be. Yeah. And I just, I just tried because there was nothing else to do but go backwards. Yeah. And I was like, I don't want to go back to where I was, you know, three years ago. So let me take this next step and see where it takes me. Mm-hmm. And I sort of fumbled my way through it. Um, and at 25, I found myself in law school. And I've been, you know, on this trajectory ever since. Mm-hmm. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate that. Just because it just sounds so mindful, right? We, we talk a lot about the importance of being not always goal oriented it's not always result based our you know steps in life right sometimes we can just live from a value based position and that might mean that as of right now i may not be doing exactly what i want to be doing or knowing exactly where i'm going to go or where i'm going to end up but i know that i have a family I know that I value hard work. I know that I value resilience and trust and love and, you know, um, moving forward and solutions. And that's where I want to stay as opposed to kind of always looking at when's my next result. I can define myself by the result. So I think that's just incredible. 
Yeah, I wish I wish my values were so noble back then. It was more about making money. <laughs> yeah. I was like, what am I going to do to get paid yeah. really well? That's so interesting. This is actually our, <laughs> our second podcast that, you know, the, the beginning of a recovering process, whether it's recovery or just, you know, living a healthier lifestyle, started with money being the biggest influence. And then what happens is that becomes less valuable. Right. And it becomes a purposeful thing that the individual is doing well that's it i think that once you start making money and you find your passion you don't worry so much as having money as the end goal because it just comes Mm -hmm. right like a lot of young lawyers ask me for advice on how to build a practice and it's just do good work Mm -hmm. the money comes you know if you're passionate about what you do and you're doing good work Mm -hmm. it will come i just that's I find like the natural reaction to being passionate and doing hard work and getting good results with each case. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I didn't have, I didn't have such noble goals. I do know, I did know that I needed to be educated because I knew that I needed that education in order to make money. I knew that I wasn't, um, I knew that I had no intention of marrying for money. I knew that I wasn't born into money. I wasn't inheriting Mm -hmm. money. And so it was a question of what am I going to do? to earn the lifestyle that I want. And I knew it was through education and sort of just fumbled back to it. Yeah, learning's a huge value. Don't just sell yourself short over there. That's very noble, okay? (laughs) I don't, I mean, as I said, I feel like you and I can kind of talk forever. And I was sharing with you that I really um, have a shared interest in philosophy and equality and social justice and stuff like that with my own education. So, yeah, I feel like we could talk a lot about everything but I do want to kind of come back to what you were talking about before in regards to labeling and this self-fulfilling prophecy because you know we were kind of chatting before that what you talk about in your amazing TED talk is what I really see is also a common trend within the field of mental health okay so maybe we can just kind of start by just talking about what it is you were referring to in that conversation you were having and then we can take it from there sure i mean the whole concept that you know the label of criminal and this certainly applies as well to drug addicts it certainly applies to people who are suffering from mental health issues you know if we start labeling per a person it in their own mind puts them in a box Mm -hmm. right oh you're gonna call me a criminal maybe i am a criminal criminal must be you know my character and it's not necessarily for some people it is right and that's that's something that i talk about as well there was huge backlash uh when i launched my tedx talks with people saying well so what all criminals should just be out walking the street and you know i'm not saying that either i'm saying we have to look at the character of a person and a lot of people are losing their own character to these labels Mm -hmm. right if we're calling someone a criminal and equating criminal with you know someone who cannot be trusted with someone who is a bad person quote unquote Um, and we do that with people who are suffering from mental health issues if we start equating that with someone who necessarily has a violent tendency then they're never going to try to be anything else because they think that they are forever categorized in this way Mm -hmm. and I think that we're in turn doing obviously an injustice to that person but an injustice to society at large Mm -hmm. we're making people more violent because they don't believe they can be anything else yeah i think what we're also doing is devaluing character through that absolutely right so it becomes then we start living in this environment where a character isn't reinforced so then why are we going to be someone with an upstanding character right right and then also uh, further on that point is when I hear you talk about looking at the character of someone, I just like immediately, Jordana, think of a client-centered care. Like right. that's essentially what client-centered care is. It's focusing on a character of an individual in an individualized way. That's it. And we can't judge the person by what they've been charged with or what label they have been astute or what a psychiatrist has considered their diagnosis to be without also considering what their experience and their situation is Mm -hmm. and how they react to the various situations that they're faced with. Because it's only when we look at a person as a whole are we able to really help them get to a different place. Mm -hmm. And they have to believe that they can get to a different place or they're not even going to bother trying. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that that accounts for a lot of the gun violence that we're seeing right now and i'm working with an organization called keep six uh, that's trying to help 
youth as well as adults who are currently involved in the criminal justice system or heading in that direction mm -hmm. escape gun violence by giving them viable alternatives. And people need to believe that they, A, have those opportunities and B, recognize their own potential. Mm -hmm. Because if they don't, then what's the point of trying to change their behavior? Yeah, and it's really a conversation about nature versus nurture. Right. You know, and so we were talking before a little bit about, you know, how with treatment and when you're dealing kind of looking at those underlying issues we really want to get to the the mind right we want to get to our beliefs so it kind of starts with the thought emotion behavior but then if the behavior how we in, like internalize our environment is the opposite it's behavior we do a behavior mm -hmm. people respond to it make us feel a specific way and then based on that emotion we believe whatever it is that we believe about that behavior and emotion so it's like this endless cycle right of just thoughts emotions behavior behavior emotions thought right thoughts emotion behavior behavior emotion thought right but we have to interrupt that in order 100%. to change the behavior yeah. and people have to recognize that that they can right and society has to recognize that they can just because someone has lived you know a violent life or a life that they've you know sp spent their time coping through drug use uh when it's time to change they really have the ability to change mm -hmm. and once you start believing that you have the ability then the only thing standing in your way really is you mm -hmm. yeah the power of belief it's amazing um so we work a lot with mandated clients here they're actually my favorite population to work <laughs> with my whole staff would tell you um and the reason for it is not that any one specific level of change is more or less or more significant than another person, right? We're very individualized. So if someone just gets out of their room and is dealing with social anxiety, that's a huge step in a house of like 30 people right. um, compared to someone who may not be struggling with that. And, you know, they're... they're you know, progress is going to look a little bit different, but with mandated clients specifically through anger management, which is a program we do on a weekly basis here, I find it's, it's quite remarkable being part of, you hope a break in that cycle right. by showing someone that, you know, there's a different way that may still get you what you want, right? Like it's a pretty good deal. You can still get what you want, but t if you take this choice, you know, you're not going to have these consequences as part of it. It's going to be that much easier to right. get to that want or need, whatever it might be. So do you find that that's, you know, part of your work too, kind of working with someone and helping them on a learned behavior? Or? So I try not to play the role of a therapist or a counselor. Mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily equipped to, it's not mm -hmm. training that I've had. I also have to delineate specific roles because, quite frankly, um, I only have so many hours in a day. I, yeah. And so for me, I have to focus on their defense. But one of the things that I do look at is I'll take their criminal record and say, what's going on here? Like, mm -hmm. is there a drug addiction component? Mm -hmm. You know, do we want to get you help? Mm -hmm. um, we talked earlier about what it means to have a mandated client. I understand it's, it's people who have been released on bail. Mm -hmm. And... Bail for me is such an important part of the process of a criminal case. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I'm starting off with a new client, uh, one who's calling me from custody, it's, okay, what are we doing about bail? What does your plan look like? And my goal is to create a plan for them that is successful, which means I don't want to just throw them into an environment where they're getting rearrested and they're going to be back in front of the courts. And I say to them, like, you're gonna have to pay me for another bail hearing if you get arrested again. So let's figure out a plan that works. And oftentimes, if they have a violent record, I'll ask whether or not there's anger management issues. Okay. It's apparent on its face to me that there would be if right. there's significant violence, but that's up for them to diagnose, not me. Okay. I can't say you need anger management because you've been arrested, you know, a dozen times for assault in the last two years. Right. Right. But, but I want them to recognize that and say, listen, what do you think about putting that as part of your plan? Mm -hmm. And if they're agreeable, I call the sureties and say, listen, go find them an anger management plan in your community and let's incorporate that. Mm -hmm. You know, when I have a guy who's been arrested four times in the last six months and every time he's arrested he's got small quantities of drugs in his pocket I'll say listen it's obvious to me that there's some sort of drug related issue here what would you would you be agreeable to having you know a counseling component play into the plan of bail so that we can create a plan that's successful for mm -hmm. you as a person right it's got to be individualized otherwise I'm just throwing them into a situation that they're going to be arrested again right 
But what about the the conversation of mitigating factors, right? Like what if you had a client that came in who was raised in the environment of, you know, an abusive home right. and their parents physically, emotionally, verbally abused them from years of birth to however old their offense was. I mean, is that something that you would try and support your client with or or kind of defend in regards to that learned behavior perhaps of this cycle that they may have been stuck in? So that often plays a part in sentencing. My my goal is to never get to the stage of sentencing because my goal with clients is to be successful and have them acquitted of their charges. Okay. So that is my, my first and foremost goal with any client is mm-hmm. how do I get you through this particular um, situation without any convictions. Mm-hmm. If there are convictions, um, then those mitigating factors play a role in sentencing because generally they help to explain the behavior. Mm -hmm. And then how much would a judge actually consider those factors? Oh, no, they take them into account for sure. They have to. They have to. The criminal code requires them to consider all mitigating as well as aggravating factors. And I have had a very, very small percentages of, of judges who don't care about what a person's circumstances were that brought them before them. I, I think that most judges want to understand what happened here. Why did you behave in this fashion? Um, now, it doesn't matter when you have you know, a conviction for first degree murder, for example, that requires a certain sentence and there really is no sentencing hearing. Mm-hmm. Um, but save and except for those cases, generally the, the court wants to understand what happened to this person. Yeah, that's very interesting and sort of reassuring to hear. You know? Yeah, there's few and far between. I mean, I'm sort of going through the Rolodex of cases <laughs> in my mind right yeah. now, but I can only think of maybe four or five judges who were completely unmoved by anything that I said where I thought they should have been or they should have recognized that there were mm-hmm. personal circumstances involved in it. And sometimes there aren't, or sometimes you don't know, or sometimes I've had clients who don't want to disclose anything about their background. Mm, interesting. And they don't want to talk about it. They don't think the judge will care they don't think the system cares they've been at it so long Mm -hmm. that they'll look at me and say listen i can give you my whole history this isn't going to make a difference to this judge so i'd rather you not even express it to the court and that for me is a frustrating situation because you know if if a case gets to the point of sentencing it's my last fight Mm -hmm. right it's the last battle in the case and when the the client takes away Anything that I have as far as a fight is concerned, it's um, it's frustrating because it's one of the things that we should be considering is the personal circumstances that that person has endured uh, that has resulted in them being in this particular situation. Yeah, absolutely. I kind of have a similar experience when I have someone who's coming from um, hospitals. I mean, it depends on the hospital. Right. I don't want to generalize. Right, here. right. Of course. <laughs> but... You know, and I find it's most commonly happens in individuals who are in active psychosis. Okay. It is so hard, Jordana, to develop trust with them because they see anyone that's affiliated or associated to medical model, you know, um, residential, that we're all just kind of after them to give them a bunch of medication and just like not listen to their story and so then they shut down right which then gives me and the team less to you know work with to develop a rapport and also to help them right right so I can completely understand the frustration behind that and then it just reaffirms their belief like oh you're not able to help me we're back in the cycle you're not helping (laughs) yourself right like you need to give me the tools that I need to help you and then I can help you but by yeah. depriving me of those tools, you deprive yourself of that ability to, to get the help you need. Yeah. Yeah. It takes a certain type of patience, I think, to be able to really be able to say, okay, this is part of the process. Trust the process. This is right. part of the unraveling of that person who may be healing at the same time. This may be part of their healing. I guess uh, the last point I kind of want to talk about is going back again to your, your TED Talk and sort of the concept behind even just the title of who judges the judge and sort of what you meant by that title um if you want to explain a little bit more on that sure um i mean it's certainly not literal right there's a judicial council that literally judges right judges so it's it's not meant it's meant to shake people up 
because it's questioning the hierarchy of the system, right? Judges sit at the top of the hierarchy of the criminal justice system. And so really it's meant to question that order. Mm -hmm. And it's a system that shows respect based on our titles, right? We give the most amount of respect to judges and then we've got lawyers and crowns and judicial officers and police officers. And at the very bottom of that hierarchy or that pyramid, you know, are all the accused people, all the criminals. And they're shown the least amount of respect in the system. Except without those people, and I, I use that term, you know, loosely, but without all of those criminals, there would be no system and there would be no order of respect that we show to those people at the top. And so it's calling it the question the system itself. But the point is to take a minute and learn someone's character before giving them the respect you think their title affords them. And maybe at the end of that character assessment, you understand that this judge deserves the utmost respect because they are a brilliant, phenomenal human being. And maybe at the end of your conversation with that criminal, uh, you think that they deserve to have this you know, title imparted upon them that does not show them the respect of a human being. Mm -hmm. I highly doubt that that will often be the case. You know, I think that the title criminal is often given to people who have made bad decisions as a result of a series of circumstances that they're faced with. Yeah. And I don't think it's necessarily a bad person. I think mm -hmm. it's a person who has made bad choices along the way. Mm -hmm. And so by making different choices, which is always open to them, they can increase sort of their character and get away from that title if we, as a system, would allow it. And right. that's the problem, right? Mm -hmm. We as a system don't allow that. People are stuck with these titles and we give them respect based on these titles without taking a second to figuring out whether or not their character matches that title. Mm -hmm. And then giving them the opportunity to do different. Yeah, and I think the saddest point for me is that if you take it one step back, you know, before maybe the criminal offense and we're dealing maybe, yes, with more substance use, just as you're saying, these could be a culmination of bad experiences that are leading to a specific event. Unfortunately, with addiction, it's usually a culmination of really difficult experiences, losses, traumas, um, you know, difficulties in life, broken homes, you know, family abuse. It's an, a, a long, painful list of, of experiences that then are unmanageable and that pain pushes an individual and what we're looking at is the symptom of that pain through addiction. And, right. it's, and it's perpetuating the cycle, right? So you have someone who's suffering from serious addiction and maybe they're out you know, selling drugs or they're out stealing from stores to pay for their addiction and then they're arrested and then they're brought to jail and there's as much if not more drugs in jail than there are on the streets, mm -hmm. uh, except they're 10 times the price. So now you've got to pay that much more to get your few points of heroin. So now you owe someone in the jail money. Now you're doing more illegal acts in order to try to repay that debt, whether it's in or out. And the system itself has perpetuated this cycle. Instead of stepping in for some early intervention saying, hey, you were stealing these cars in order to pay for an addiction. Instead of sending you to jail, let's get you into rehab. Let's get you to figure 100%. out what those underlying issues are. And so I think we spend a lot of time imprisoning people who really need help dealing with drug addiction, dealing with mental health issues, dealing with personal circumstances. And if we did a better job of intervening earlier, uh, we would keep those people out of the system as opposed to having them spin through the revolving door even quicker. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's just such a perfect way to end the conversation. <laughs> I don't think I can say it any better, actually. Um, I completely am in awe of the things that you do and what you stand for, Jordana, and your own personal story. I think you should feel really proud of yourself. Thank you. I yeah. appreciate that. Thanks for mm -hmm. having me on. This is uh, it's a great program that you guys are offering people. Yeah, I, thank I really you so much. In, we just want to share. Doing. Yeah, just share education and awareness, right? It's all about conversation and the power of conversation. So for anyone who's, you know, and I really want to take this moment to just reach out to anyone who may be listening the, to this particular podcast. Um, if, if you are in need of help or you need to 
contact anybody, you can go to our website, addictionrehabtoronto.ca, or call our toll-free number at 1-855-787-2424. It's open 24 hours a day, every day of the year. Um, And just take that first step because we know there's a lot of people struggling. So thank you so much again, Jordana. And I admire so much of the work you do and what you stand for. So thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah.